Sir Robert Bobby Charlton is one of the most esteemed and respected footballers of all time. The star of the England and Manchester United squads in the 1960s, he survived the Munich air disaster in 1958 and was knighted in 1994, underlining his status as a legend in his home country. As a midfielder, Bobby was renowned for his attacking instincts and his dangerous long-range shots. These days, he sits on the board of directors at Manchester United. Bobby Charlton was born on October the 11th, 1937 in Ashington, a Northumberland town in the northeast of England. Ashington has produced no fewer than 10 professional footballers. It has a population of around 27,000 people and is also the hometown of cricketing brothers Steve and Ben Harmison. Bobby was not the only talented footballer in his family. His elder brother Jack was a defender for Leeds United and the English national team. His uncles include Jack Milburn, Leeds United and Bradford City, George Milburn, Leeds United and Chesterfield, Jim Milburn, Leeds and Bradford City, and Stan Milburn, Chesterfield, Leicester City and Rochdale. And if he needed any more mentors, he could also call on his mother's cousin, legendary Newcastle United forward Jackie Milburn. However, Bobby would soon eclipse all of his relatives to become one of England's favourite sons. He played for East Northumberland Schools in 1953, where he was spotted by Manchester United Chief Scout Joe Armstrong at the age of 15. He went on to be selected for Manchester's youth squad and England schoolboys. Out of respect for his mother's fears that a footballing career would be less than secure, he took up an apprenticeship as an electrical engineer before turning professional in October 1954. He quickly worked his way up through the hierarchy. After scoring regularly in the youth and reserve teams, he made his first team debut against Charlton Athletic in October 1956, two years after turning professional. He was doing his national service at Shrewsbury at the time. Manager Matt Busby had advised him to apply there so he could still play for United at the weekend. He made 14 appearances during his first season for the club, which went on to win the league's first division. Unfortunately, however, they were denied the 20th century's first double after losing the controversial 1957 FA Cup final to Aston Villa. The loss came after goalkeeper Ray Wood was carried off with a broken cheekbone following a clash with Villa centre forward Peter McPartland. In the days before goalkeeping substitutes, halfback Jackie Blanchflower took over, but couldn't stop United from losing 2-1. Bobby had done enough in his first season to become a regular first team member. He had scored 10 goals in his 14 league appearances and garnered another three seasons in cup and European football. His next season at the club was to be a memorable one. Manchester United started the season as defending champions and would go on to become the first English team to compete in the European Cup. The Cup, which had previously been scorned by the Football Association, saw United progressing all the way to the semi-finals, where they were eventually beaten by title holders Real Madrid. Over the next year, Bobby would establish himself as a fully-fledged star of the team. After surviving the Munich plane crash of 1958, which decimated the team, he suddenly found himself thrust into the spotlight as a veteran of the side at the age of 20. He rose to the challenge, winning the respect of his manager and the adoration of the fans. During his club career, Bobby Charlton would become the most famous of the Busby Babes. A term reportedly coined by Manchester Evening News journalist Tom Jackson. It was used to refer to the Manchester United players who were recruited and trained by Chief Scout Joe Armstrong and assistant manager Jimmy Murphy, who had progressed to the first team under the guidance of manager Matt Busby, who had a long-term plan to rebuild the squad after the Second World War. They were called babes because of their youth and talent and they became notable as a young team that had been developed with the club instead of being brought in from other teams. Busby's Babes won the league championship in the 55, 56 
and 56-57 seasons, with an average age of 21 and 22 respectively. Bobby Charlton was one of the few who survived the plane crash relatively unscathed. Tragically, it claimed eight of his teammates. Not surprisingly, United failed to progress any further in the European Cup that year. But they still managed to make the FA Cup final, where goodwill and sentiment couldn't get them over the line against Bolton Wanderers. They lost 2-0. They fell behind in the league, as Matt Busby set to work on the difficult task of rebuilding the club. He welcomed in a crop of new players, which included the phenomenal George Best, but the new look team had to wait until the 62-63 season for its first taste of success, winning the FA Cup by beating Leicester City 3-1 in the final. With his eye-catching performances, Bobby Charlton began to rack up individual honours. After a dominant 65-66 season, he was awarded the coveted European Player of the Year award, which provided some consolation for a trophyless season at the club. Matt Busby managed to bring Manchester United into yet another successful era after the Munich crash had stalled the progress of his team. As well as winning the FA Cup in 1963, despite finishing a lowly 19th in the league, they went on to win the league title again in 65 and 67. Bobby formed part of a formidable lineup for Manchester United, along with the likes of George Best and Dennis Law. The trio became famous for their talent and influence on their team. By 1964, the rebuilding of the side was complete. Bobby and Bill Foulkes were the only plane crash survivors left in the team, and the signings of players like the aforementioned Best and Law, along with Pat Crenard and Noel Cantwell, brought the era of the Busby Babes to an end. Inspired by English rugby club Salford, who went by the nickname the Red Devils, Matt Busby decided to adopt the same nickname for United. It stuck, and soon enough, the Red Devil was incorporated into the merchandise and later the team badge. In 1967, Bobby took over from Dennis Law as captain of the club. He led the team to victory against Benfica in the 1968 World Cup, winning 4-1 and becoming the first English club to win. He finished his career at Manchester in 1973. His record of 758 appearances has since been broken by Ryan Giggs, but his goal tally of 249 still stands. Over the course of his 19 seasons, Manchester won the league three times and the FA Cup and European Cup once. Bobby Charlton's international career is no less impressive than his club career. He was the nation's most capped player on his retirement in 1970, with 106 appearances. That record has since been eclipsed, but few players will ever be able to match Bobby's crowning moment at the historic 1966 World Cup. In 1966, at the age of 28, and after many international heroics, he was called upon yet again by his country to take part in the World Cup. As the Cup's host nation, England didn't need to qualify. They were put in Group 1, which included Uruguay, Mexico and France. It was a difficult group, with Uruguay considered the strongest opposition. But England had come into the World Cup with one of their strongest teams ever. The team featured some of England's biggest all-time stars, including Bobby Moore, the team captain, Gordon Banks, Jimmy Greaves, and Charlton himself. Uruguay proved their worth as England's chief opponents in Group 1. And the two teams drew in their first group match. Uh, well, we're, we were all very pleased with Monday's performance. Naturally, we were a little bit disappointed as much that we didn't win, but um, we all feel that uh, Uruguay will be one of the most difficult teams to beat in the tournament, so um, we're all quite happy. Next up were Mexico, who had drawn with France 1-1 in their first match. England would go into the match as favourites, with the team confident they could go all the way. 
You've seen some of the other sides play. You, you got any personal favourites for the cup yourself? Any personal England, tips? England. Jackie's brother Bobby set English fans alight by scoring the opening goal of the match as the team went on to triumph 2-0. After another 2-0 win against France, there was time for the team to relax before plunging headfirst into the quarterfinals. Their quarterfinal opponent was a strong Argentinian side. England rolled on into the finals, defeating Argentina 1-0 to set up a semi-final with Portugal. Bobby was the hero, scoring both of England's goals in the 2-1 win. You tend to think of it after such a good result as though we've won it, you know, and we haven't. We've won more hurdle to go. We just hope that we get over that one, you know, and then we can really start to celebrate. The excitement in England was palpable. Their team was one win away from a historic victory in front of a home crowd. The opponent was West Germany. Well, we want to win it, you know. We want to win it. We'll keep our fingers crossed and try and keep our feet on the ground till then. The match lived up to expectations. 98,000 people crammed into Wembley Stadium. It was the first time an English team had reached the final of the World Cup. A match on home soil gave the side the perfect opportunity. With the weight of a nation on their shoulders, the English squad went 2-1 up in the 78th minute and looked set for victory until West Germany equaled with one minute on the clock, sending the match into extra time. But England would not be denied, and after scoring two more goals in extra time, the historic win was theirs. 4-2 was the final margin, and the nation celebrated a crowning achievement in their sporting history. On February 6, 1958, British European Airways Flight 609 ended in tragedy attempting to take off from Munich Rhine Airport. On February the 6th, in 1959 was a, was a dreadful accident and the worst accident that possibly has ever happened to any, any uh, football club. On the return flight to London, after the European Cup clash with the Yugoslavian team, Manchester United's chartered plane had made a scheduled stop at Munich to refuel. With slush covering the end of the runway, the plane had failed to build up enough speed to reach an adequate height. With nowhere to go, it ploughed into the fence surrounding the airport. The left side of the cockpit hit a tree and the right side of the fuselage collided with a wooden hut, inside which was a truck filled with tyres and fuel, which exploded. Miraculously, 21 out of the 44 passengers survived the horrific crash. Among the dead were eight Manchester United players and three of the club staff. It was one of the biggest, the biggest um, sporting tragedies that can ever be. The reverberations of the Munich air disaster were felt so deeply back at Old Trafford, rumours began circulating that the club was set to fall. Despite struggling to field the team, the Red Devils dug deep and played on. There was a lot of uh, really hard work to be done, you know, there was lots of things had to be done. Um, eventually a, te a team was put together and, and it survived, we had, uh, it, but it, it took a long time before eventually we could, we could actually come together with a team that, that Sir Matt Busby, that Matt Busby who was then the manager, uh, thought was was good enough to represent Manchester United as the old team had done. Almost immediately, plaques and memorials were erected, with the first unveiled in February 1960. Bobby was pleased to have somewhere to remember the teammates he lost on the worst day in Manchester United's history. And, um, and it's right that it should be remembered, so people will have a place to come where they can pay their respects. On February 6, 2008, the 50th anniversary of the disaster, a memorial service was held at Old Trafford. Sir Bobby was joined by fans, officials and other survivors of the tragedy to pay their respects at the ceremony. Great players like Byrne, Coleman, Jones, Pegg, Taylor, Jeff Bent and Liam Whelan all lost their lives at the scene of the crash. Young football prodigy Duncan Edwards was also to die of his injuries 15 days later in a German hospital. Edwards was just 21. If it had not been for goalkeeper Harry Gregg, 
who stayed behind to pull survivors out of the wreckage, the disaster could have been much worse. Bobby was one of the lucky ones rescued by Greg. A few years earlier, Sir Bobby had fought back tears as a plaque was unveiled in Germany at the site of the tragedy. The memorial stone in the Munich district of Kirchtutering featured the names of the 23 people who had died. It's, uh, it's a very nice um, plaque which a lot of our fans would like to come to see, to pay their respects. Despite his brilliant career, Bobby has since admitted that he has never come to terms with the tragedy. Just as busy off the pitch as he ever was on, Sir Bobby Charlton has been involved in a variety of different pursuits since retiring from football in 1980. He eventually found his calling in community work. In 2003, he and Ryan Giggs visited the proposed Ground Zero memorial site for British workers who died in the September 11 attacks. It was such a momentous occasion that um you know, no, nobody in the world, especially in the sporting world, I, I don't think could ever not be affected by it. So we Brits all, all would like to just leave something to, to let everybody know that we do think a lot about what happens, what happened, and, and of the American people. We've done it all before, and we want as much money to be raised as possible so that we can get the garden built, and, and it's there for everyone to see. He commented on the 2003 Champions World Series soccer tournament. It's been terrific, really, you know, the biggest crowd that's ever been in, in Seattle Stadium and a big crowd in Los Angeles, both these games here in, in New York and Philadelphia sold out. It's great, it's great for us and it's great for the game of football and certainly great for American football, especially if we have good games and people see the high quality that's necessary if the Americans have to come onto the big stage. Three years later in South Africa, he was one of 13 of the world's most influential sportsmen and sportswomen who visited children from the Laureus Sport for Good projects. The non-profit, non-political organisation is a unique association of the greatest living sporting legend, who share a belief in the power of sport to break down barriers, bring people together and improve the lives of young people around the world. Tennis star Monica Sellers was among the sporting legends who spent the afternoon with the children. I think hopefully we give kids an inspiration. I mean, they get to see the best of the best in all the different sports from around the world. And I think a lot of us started out with very humble beginnings, that if you have a dream, you work hard, uh, a lot of things can happen. Fellow tennis star Martina Navratilova was just as excited to be part of the event. I mean, everybody's so excited to see us here, and it's great to be a part of a great, great group of athletes uh, that are here. The afternoon was a success, and it wasn't just the children who enjoyed themselves. It's a marvellous response, and everyone's so happy and pleased to see us, which is what we like. And, uh, and of course, it's marvellous, all these, what sport can do. The event was held in Alexandra, South Africa, one of the poorest and overcrowded areas of the region. Not only has Bobby been heavily involved in the community, he has also kept strong ties with the game that made him famous. Between 1973 and 1975, he was a player manager of Preston North End. He took on a managing role one more time in 1983, when he became the caretaker manager for Wigan Athletic. In 1984, after the great Sir Matt Busby left the board at Old Trafford, he happily accepted the invitation to take his place, and is still a board member today. One of his proudest moments after football came in 1994, when he received a knighthood for his services to the game. Although he was only the second footballer to be knighted, he has since been joined by 13 more who have received the same honour. He was also instrumental in London's successful bid for the 2012 Olympic Games. In early 2005, he was part of a team that took the IOC Commission on a tour of London. Bobby showed the visitors around the new Wembley Stadium. They seemed very, very happy and very impressed with everything about Wembley. That's, that's my feeling. They were, I, I don't think they appreciated the scale and the size of the new Wembley Stadium and, and how imposing it is. It's just sensational. 
Wembley Stadium, which was the home of England's sole World Cup victory, holds a special place in the hearts of footballers who have graced its turf. Every player around the world, and I don't care who it was, Di Stefano or Pele or Eusebio or Franz Beckenbauer, they, they all speak with great fondness of, of playing at Wembley. And um, it, it is unique in its atmosphere and its and the, the history, the tradition of, of football in this country. So Wembley is a very big part of it. And um, I think in the future, we're going to be very proud of the new Wembley too. After a rich history, the old Wembley was closed in 2000 and was demolished three years later. Although the new stadium was scheduled to be opened in 2006, after many delays, it finally got off the ground in March 2007. Considered to be one of the greatest English players of all time, Sir Bobby Charlton received another great honour in 2002, as one of the few inaugural players to be inducted into the English Football Hall of Fame. He followed up the domestic honour in 2008 by being inducted into the European Hall of Fame for his footballing efforts in European competitions. Despite these achievements, Bobby remains as humble as ever. I'm a footballer and didn't just tried my best and uh, hoped that my ability was, was good enough to get me some success, which I've been lucky enough to have done. In May 2009, it was Manchester United's turn to pay tribute to Sir Bobby by unveiling a statue dubbed the Holy Trinity. The bronze statue commemorates one of the greatest attacking trios ever seen, Charlton, Best and Law. As well as these great honours, Sir Bobby has received a trophy haul that would rival any of the world's top sporting legends. With over 40 individual honours to his name, 12 club titles and a FIFA World Cup, his career still stands as one of the most successful the game has ever seen. Although he retired from the game close to four decades ago, he still holds the Manchester United record for top goal scorer with 249 goals. His remarkable story which takes in a brush with death at the beginning of his career, a glittering record at one of England's most celebrated clubs and a historic World Cup victory has inspired millions of young footballers to chase their dreams. Although he may claim that his unsurpassed success was a matter of luck, there can be no denying his incredible football talent, heroic bravery, unwavering dedication and unbelievable mental strength. Sir Bobby Charlton is truly a football legend.